Welcome back everyone to your ACFCS tip of the week. This is Brian Monroe, Vice President of Content here at ACFCS. Now here's our question to you for this week. What do you do to create a compliance program when there's no law or regulation that says you have to create a compliance program? But here's the rub. If you create that compliance program, that's the only thing that if you break the law could help lower or even negate a potential penalty. Well, why am I asking this? As we all know, in the last few weeks, there's been a massive deluge of guidance from the key government agencies over financial crimes compliance, enforcement, sanctions. So let's get into some of this. And again, key concept to just remember here is a theme running through all of these guidance pages, dozens of pages of guidance, is effectiveness. Remember that word. Tone at the top, culture of compliance, and effectiveness. Now. The U.S. Department of Justice came out with key updates to its corporate compliance guidance. Now, this is guidance, again, we all know about anti-money laundering, AML guidance for banks. This is compliance guidance if you're not a bank, if you're a corporate. Now, take out the AML piece, the money laundering piece. Every corporate on the planet has to worry about fraud. They have to worry about corruption. They have to worry about insiders doing illicit things. Now, if you make a mistake, this guidance is going to help you create a program that would actually meet or exceed regulatory expectations and potentially get you credit at the negotiating table later. Now, also the Office of Foreign Assets Control, they've never, OFAC, our sanctions overlords, they've never put out an SCP, what it looks like, sanctions compliance program. They did, and again, this is a huge issue because, again, contextual point here, with this compliance program, it's Sanctions, we all know, is if you make a mistake, that's it. OFAC has got you. It's just deciding the penalty. Having this compliance program is the only thing that could lower that penalty again, or in its absence, if you don't have a compliance program, more easily OFAC can say you have an egregious failure. The last piece of this puzzle, the U.S. Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, our country's financial intelligence unit, came out with guidance on P2P virtual currency exchanges on when and in what scenarios engaging in these P2P activities in the virtual currency space trip anti-money laundering rules. Now let's get into some of this guidance. And again, like I said, what's weaving through all of this, that trend of effectiveness. Now, three questions you have to answer. And there's a new one here when I get to question number two that you have to absolutely key in on. The first question, is the corporation's compliance program well designed? Number two, this is how it was written before in the prior guidance, is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? And here's the change. In other words, is the program being implemented effectively? That's a big jump in expectation from good faith efforts to actually effectively implement it. Question three, does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? Now. Three pieces to this guidance, I'll break them down. Part one, two, and three. Part one, risk assessments, training, and tip lines. Now, this looks at your risk assessments, the policies and procedures, training and communications, and again, if you have a confidential whistleblower tip line. Part two, effectiveness, tone at the top, and resources. This details the effective implementation of a compliance program, including, as again, the commitment by senior and middle management the autonomy of the compliance professionals, the resources, the incentives for them to do right disciplinary measures if they do wrong. Part three, this I refer to as effectiveness in action, failings and remediation. This analyzes the metrics of a compliance program if it is in fact operating effectively, exploring a capacity for continuous improvement, periodic, again, like the AML context, periodic testing and review, investigation of misconduct, analysis and, and remediation, of underlying failures. Now, these are absolutely huge and again, can be a huge asset to you at the negotiating table if you find yourself in a failing corporate compliance program. Now, let's go to OFAC. There's gonna be a lot of tenets that are very similar in the AML context. Policies and procedures, training risk assessments, but done through the OFAC lens, but also training. Training is such a huge issue to make sure that whatever alerts are coming from your sanctioned screening system, 
that people can look at those, understand what they mean. The, even former OFAC law enforcement agents should be part of this program that helps understand are these hits, what's going on behind the scenes, are these proxies for Iran working through Turkey. That's kind of the depth that these OFAC compliance reviewers are looking for. You have to, again, we'll go through some of these very quickly, but basically management commitment, risk assessments, internal controls similar to AML, testing and auditing, and as we mentioned, training is absolutely huge. Now, let's touch on the FinCEN guidance that again, answered a question for me that I had been asking for months of a lot of my sources. What scenarios of engaging in these P2B transactions actually trip AMLs? Because we all know people are going places like local Bitcoins, and this is basically a platform that puts together sellers and seekers of virtual currency and helps them kind of settle up a buy when things are going high, sell when virtual currency is dropping. And here is the answer to that question. If you go on an exchange, even if it's a P2P exchange, there's no virtual currency exchanger. If you are doing that and you're actually moving fiat currency to virtual, virtual to fiat currency, and you're doing this for other people through that P2P exchange, and you're doing it as a business, then now you have tripped anti-money laundering requirements. You are a money transmitter. And the theme throughout this guidance, it doesn't matter the name of the virtual coin, it doesn't matter if it's an ICO, initial coin offering, if you're transferring value from fiat to virtual and back, you're doing it as a business, you're doing it for other people, you are a money transmitter. Now, this is a lot to go on, I suggest you read all of this, there's a lot of meat to this, and it can actually make the difference between getting penalized, getting no penalty at all, and having a very expensive remediation or no remediation at all. So everyone, thank you so much for being here. If you have any more questions about ACFCS, our products, our training, our certification, really the best certification, broadest and deepest in the industry, please go to acfcs.org.